Welcome to The Lost. This is your host, The Razor's Edge, and joining me is Shadaloo. What's up, bitches? Yep. Tonight, we're gonna... Well, we're gonna cover, you know, the recent news about MKXL, Triborg footage, and all that. The bulk of the show, the first, though, uh, first, will be... Was that? First. First. Okay. Warm, hearty, helping hand to us for finally doing a Lost episode for the first time in, like, what, three months? It's It's been a while. <laughs> Self-congratulatory <laughs> applause. I don't think here, 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 here's me. Patting myself on the back. There we go. All right, let's go. All right, go. all right. Now that we've got that over with, our uh, self, a uh, little bit masturbation, a little bit flagellation. <laughs> I was uh, raised Catholic, so I'm very familiar with both of those practices. Mm, mm. That's a shame. <laughs> and that, I mean, I'm encouraged not to do the former, but always the latter. Ah, uh, yes. It, they, they found me on monastery doorstep is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> All right, I'll stop now. Uh, were you ever uh, smacked on the hand with a ruler by a nun? <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, no. Never was. But the first time I heard that expression, I did it to myself. I don't recommend it. Mm, just to see what it would feel like. Just to see what it would feel like. It is not pleasant. I uh, I wouldn't imagine it would be. Although I'm sure there are some people who are into that. It always depends what you're into. Yeah, so, so anyway, as I was about to say, the majority of today's episode will be a discussion of Mortal Kombat, the novel by Jeff Rovin, which came out in... 1993, 94? Something along those lines. No, it, it couldn't have been 94, could it have? Um, I think the publishing date in the book here says 95, actually. It's a little surprising you know to what? me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There is, There are versions of MK2 characters in that game. One yeah. or two of them. Not too yeah, many, there, are, but, uh, there are MK1 and 2 characters, but there's no MK3 characters, so I'm a little surprised by 95. I feel like the, the novel is probably being written as MK2 was just coming out. Like, uh, Jeff probably got some information on who was going to be there, uh, what kind of characters were going to be present. It mainly does concern the original seven characters, though, for the most part. Well, I would... We'll, we'll get into this more, but I would say the original six characters... Because Johnny's actually not in the book. Hmm. Right, forgot about that. Yeah. I thought that was weird. Well, I remember, yeah, I remember now. That bugged me. Inside cover, there's like, if I, if I remember right. Yeah, there's the inside cover looks like the, um, it's like a painting version of the cover of the comic book, the the official comic by Tobias. Yeah. They're all, it's got, you know, Goro and Shang and uh, Sonya, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Kano, and Raiden all like stand. Well, it's I guess Johnny is like way in the back in this picture, but they're all like standing on a mountain, that's, posing in front of lightning, just like the cover of the comic. That's it. Like that's what I remember. Johnny is in there, but he's way at the back, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's like he's like in the farthest. He's like peeking, like Sonya or Jade in the Living Forest. <laughs> <laughs> there just wasn't room for him in this bizarre, strange, marvelous, funny little narrative. You know what? Just so we have a good reference point, that I'm, I'm, I'm here with you on, on the same page. I'm gonna grab my copy of the novel. It's two feet behind me. Why don't you describe the premise of it to our dear listeners? Well, it's essentially, it's actually, you'd think it would be a novelization of the first tournament. It's actually a prequel. A significant portion of the book is actually the great Kung Lao's backstory. And then when it gets to the present day, it's mostly about um, Goro and Shang trying to get their hands on an amulet that belonged to the great Kung Lao that I guess gave him super strength or something. Because, um, well, mostly because Shang is getting weaker with old age, and, um, there's a bit of story where, in this version of the narrative, uh, when Shang wins in the tournament, the souls he steals don't go to him, they actually go straight through a portal to Shao Kahn, and the more souls he gets, the closer Khan gets to invading the Earth. Like, there's the... The criteria Shao Kahn needs to invade is he has to acquire a certain number number of souls as opposed to winning ten tournaments. And, um, it's actually, like, they go, 
in-depth, and I mean, none of it is canon. It's, it's all its own take on the lore. But there's a lot of, like, exploration in-depth of, like, the nature of Outworld as, like, this realm of spirits and demons. It's almost characterized more like the Nether Realm, And, you know, like, when a, when a character from Outworld crosses over to Earth, in a lot of cases, they're, like, they have to take a different form. Like, Shang is actually an Outworld demon reincarnated as a, as an Earth Realm human. It's worth bearing, well, worth noticing, uh, worth stating, I should say, rather. God, so tired tonight. The description of Outworld, such as we're discussing it, really colored my perception and sort of continues to, to this day, of Outworld is a very, very twisted, dark, and messed up place. There's a certain passage that's always really stuck with me. There's a, as, there's a section where Sonya has been captured, and you know she looks around her, and the the hallways of where she's being kept are described as being kind of non-Euclidean in nature. You know, hallways that seem to slope down from a distance actually slope up. Things that go left actually go right. You know, all sorts of extrasensory perception being messed with it's lovecraftian is the word yeah lovecraftian is a good word for it i was i was going to compare it a little bit to silent hill (laughs) (laughs) the uh my favorite thing about the the part where sonya is captured is that they intend to uh sacrifice her to shang sung's carrier pigeon yes and the the, (laughs) the person who's going to do the the killing is Baraka. Like, he's a... Who is a priest. Yeah, he's like a cultist priest in this story. So Which basically, is... like, going on, I've always imagined, like, just, just Baraka, but just wearing one of the, uh, shadow priest robes. Yeah, with right. With, like, like... slick back over his head. And I've kind of always wanted to see that as a costume for him. And it was really funny when Annihilation came along, and he's standing up on top of that cage, and he throws something back, and I'm like, Wow. Yeah, like, Someone he, else he shows up to that scene wearing a cloak. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always, had a th- I've always kind of had a hope that cloaked Baraka would become kind of a canon thing in the game. So this has an alternate costume. <laughs> I love the way it looks. It's a, uh, it's certainly an interesting take on the character. I think it has a more personality than the actual canon, I'm just the leader of a tribe of savages thing. You know, if nothing else, I think that, I, th- well, I mean, I guess we have Shang for that, but... I always kind of envisioned Shao Kahn having like a proper priestly leader performing ritual sacrifices for someone for whom that's very much a part of their character. Well, I, th- I think it be... would I think it would add dimension to Outworld in general if like all the characters from there sort of treated Khan more like a god they worship as opposed to just the king. That's always the way I've wanted to see it, no doubt. Because he's, he's definitely presented that way in this book as, like, this uh, ethereal Lord of the Demons sort of character. There's it definitely kind of really, a lot of, yeah. of prayer and supplication, and the there's a lot of mythology to it. And, like, the book is heavily based on, um, like, the, like, Rovin definitely did a lot of research into Chinese mythology. Because what I found interesting is that uh, they talk about, like, the origins of Outworld and Raiden and Khan are, like, these these lesser gods, and, like, they all come from, like, a a greater god who's sort of actually, like, the one being from Deception. That is very true. Like, the, the origin was, uh, story yeah, is almost Pan-Poo. identical. There's, like, th- there was this one god who, like, died and everything comes from him. I've never really brought this up so much, but uh, ever since they brought the concept of the one being, that's kind of what I suspected, that someone went back and actually took a little bit from this novel, going, hey, this whole Panku thing, not a bad idea. Well, the the one being also resembles a great deal of um, the, the Brahma, I think, or Shiva in Christian mythology. Shiva and Christian not, mythology? Not, Christ, not Christian, Hindu. I'm thinking of Hindu. I don't know why I said... I think <laughs> like, I said uh... Christian, because I was thinking of Krishna, which is... We'll just forget I said easily, that. <laughs> easily forgiven. Words. Just words. Words that sound similar. But I'm, I'm, I definitely meant Hindu. <laughs> the Christian Shiva. Man, I missed that passage of the Bible back in Catholic school. 
well, too yeah. busy flagellating myself. Those are ah. those are the uh, those are the books that they uh, suppressed the Catholics. <laughs> so, Speaking what else jumps out at you from the book? There's a lot. There's there's so much to talk about. Yeah, there's well, there's sort of what I I found weird, like younger Kung Lao from MK2 is in the book, but mm-hmm. he's presented but. as a straight up monk, like just a a bald guy in robes, no hat. Yes, I kept waiting for the hat to show up the first time <laughs> I read this thing. I'm like, he's just gonna like get over this whole pacifism angle, isn't he? He's gonna like get the hat and go to war. And again, I'm, I'm realizing realizing this now as we're talking about this for, for the first time because I've never really talked to anyone about this novel. And in the past ten minutes, as we've discussed Khan's godhood status, the way I proceed outworld, I don't think I realized up until this very moment how much this little book has affected the way I've seen Mortal Kombat over the years. Some parts of it have just blended in with the canon for me to such an extent that I've kind of always been blind to that, I suppose. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I've always kind of seen Kung Lao as a total pacifist. And that's not strictly speaking completely true, because, I mean, MK3 and 4 do specify that he'd rather not be fighting, but I guess that my reading this book has kind of took that to another level. I mean, here's the thing. This is this was my first time reading this book about a couple weeks ago. I got it as a Christmas present from a friend. The thing with Kung Lao for me was always that in MK3 and 4, it says that he he he's basically changing his mind. He doesn't want to fight anymore and wants to find yeah. a life of pacifism, which implies that before that, like during the tournament and everything, he was a, a more violent, like willing to fight. So I... When Shaolin Monks came along and it retconned into him into this, like, uh, younger than Liu Kang and jealous of him because he wanted to go to the tournament, I was more readily accepting of that because it fit in more with, like, how I thought of Kung Lao as opposed to, I think most people saw him as the pacifist because of MK3 and that it didn't really occur to them that MK3 was about him changing his life. No, you're, you've got a definite point there. Now, compound that to my perception of Kung Lao, such as it is after all these years of having this novel. and I, I, used to, I used to flip through this thing at least once every couple of months. I loved this book. Still do to some extent. <laughs> but the, the, the Kung Lao angle in Shaolin Monks pissed me off to no, to no end. I was angry, so angry. Even, even today, I still think it's way too much. And I was disappointed I, that MK9 kind of continued It's definitely to too much. I think I think that MK9 did it more. I don't want to say subtly, but elegantly. Believably, like the, the dialogue was just better written in general. That's fair. A lot of things out there are better written than Shaolin Monks. Yeah, Sha- Shaolin Monks. I love that game, but those cutscenes. That is the worst dialogue in the series. Are you okay? says Liu Kang to the monk who's been stabbed in the head, thrown against the wall, and slid down. Yes, it's, it's all you need. That one he scene stabbed is him all through the brain, right set him on fire, and threw him 30 feet. Are you okay? <laughs> that is the one line you need to bring up to, to anyone who tries to tell you that Shaolin Monk's story has shit worthwhile going down in it. Oh, yeah. But, but no, like, the thing is, like, I was reminded a little bit in terms of, like, Kung Lao being more more of a traditional monk in this book. I was reminded a little bit of Legacy, where, like... I mean, not that Liu Kang is a bad guy or an asshole in this book at all, because he's not, but, like, just, just in terms of how Legacy sort of flipped the characters around, where the most peaceful pacifist one was Kung Lao and Liu was the hot-blooded one. <laughs> But, yeah, like, that's another thing I found interesting. Like, the White Lotus Society and Liu Kang are presented sort of like... It's almost like they're they're a club of, like, vigilantes or crime fighters. Because Liu is, like, partnered with Sonya in this book. Like, they're both... Like, Sonya starts the story undercover, infiltrating the Black Dragon Gang. She's a member (laughs) of... uh, yeah, yeah, this little team who's traveling around with Kano because Kano's been hired by Shang to get uh, this amulet they're looking for. 
It's always a fucking amulet. <laughs> it is what always an amulet. What is with it's that? It's always a fucking amulet. There are so many <laughs> amulets in Mortal Kombat. Again, possibly the reason that I'm angrier than most people about the fact that there are goddamn amulets everywhere. This is just one more subconsciously that I've always attributed to being part of the story, I guess. But actually, I don't remember particularly that much about Liu Kang in this story because, I mean, I guess apart yeah, from he's... the fact that he's sort of a secret agent, man, his, his, his portrayal is one of the more consistent ones with the he's, games. He's in it very little. Like, he, yeah. he mostly just sort of shows up as this... He's actually more like a ninja, because he's in sort of an all-black well. spy suit, and he's, like, after the Black Dragons, you know, teamed up with Sonya, and he's, like, just sort of following along and tracking them. And then he um, he gets to the village of the Order of Light after uh, Kano has been there, and there's, like, there's Black Dragon guys holding village members hostage. And Raiden sends a bolt of lightning down from a distance to attack them. And after the explosion the lightning causes, Liu Kang suddenly finds that he can light his hands on fire and shoot fireballs. Like, yes. that's the origin of his superpowers. <laughs> it was a Marvel superheroes moment, for sure. <laughs> it's a little weird. <laughs> There's weirder parts, though. I'd forgotten about that bit. But uh, we'll get to weirder parts when we get back to Kung Lao later on. Yeah. Specifically Kung Lao and Kano. But we'll get there. Yeah. So, the, like I said, the story starts out with, like, basically the origins of the great Kung Lao. And their version of the story is that it's, like, back in, back in ancient China, he was, um... The weird thing I noticed is that they very quickly reference that he was, I guess, adopted by his aunt or something, and his aunt's husband was actually Shang Tsung. Yep. So... But but he he really doesn't um, know Shang much, because Shang had disappeared at that point. Like, he faked his own death so that he could um, learn about the dark arts in secret and find the island. That's correct. And when I, Shang when a... Shang gets to the island, he finds out like he finds a portal to Outworld there and learns that he's actually a reincarnated demon from Outworld who had been sent to Earth to open the way for Khan. And, and at that point on he was like, Alright, I'm okay with this. This brings purpose to my life. Yeah, well he accepts it immediately because apparently yep. he he immediately remembers having been a demon. Yep. And, um, like, when he goes back to Earthrealm to start uh, setting up, you know, taking over the, the Mortal Kombat tournament and all that stuff, um, Khan sends this little, like, a, like an imp demon with him who's, like, trapped in a summoning circle. Ah, Ruthe. Yeah, he's almost like a, I want to call him a comedy relief character, but not really. It's more like he's sort of sad and pathetic. He's sad and pathetic. And he's kind of almost a bit of a voice of reason for Shang, if I'm remembering right. Yeah. I do remember enjoying the character a great deal and feeling bad for the little guy, because he's not so much a simpering toady as just a little guy trying to do his best by Shao Kahn and dealing with the shit hand that Khan's given him. And he just, he spends so many years as this element in the summoning circle that bridges the gap. This This stuck with me. He's basically used to, like, keep the summoning circle between Earth and Outworld open. So he spends many years in this circle, becoming a part of it, and slowly going insane. Yeah, like, the thing, like, reality in the circle is, like, time slows down and speeds up in weird ways, so he's kind of tortured all the time. Yeah. His dialogue reminded me of a little bit... Uh, any any comic book readers listening to this right now might uh, recognize the reference to the way uh, Hunter Zolomon, the second Zoom, the Flash villain, talks. In terms of, like, speeding up and slowing yeah, down? Yeah, just, like, in the middle yeah. of sentences, like, all of a sudden his voice will be, like, not Alvin and the Chipmunks, but faster, and then it'll drag out really slow, like, he can't control fast and slow. Now you combine that with a kind of manic insanity after being trapped in this thing for so long, you kind of get a sense of how bad the little guy's got it. Yeah, yeah, it's, 
he's got it pretty rough. But but um on the on the Shang Tsung Kung Lao front, thinking yeah. back on it now, the fact that they were almost distant related kind of adds a bit of a sad element to their whole relationship. Because I enjoy this about it. One of the things that, that's interesting to me about this book is like how much time is spent covering Kung Lao's journey to the tournament and preparing himself. Heh <laughs> preparing himself. Sorry. That was a subconscious one. But um <laughs> not like this relationship that he forms with Shang over the course of like them fighting again and again so many years and Shang finally saying, Fuck it, here's Goro, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, yeah, that was that was, was an interesting yeah. thing, I thought. In in according to the book, uh the first several Mortal Kombat tournaments weren't every generation, they were like held once a year. So Kung Lao and Shang fought each other a whole bunch of times, and Shang kept getting his ass kicked again and again and again. And and each time he'd fail to bring any souls to Khan, he'd actually lose a piece of his own soul, which was the book's explanation for his rapid aging. But, um... <laughs> the thing, um... No, go on. So... So, it touches on Shang very little. Like, it's all like, he used to be, I guess, like a tax collector before he started remembering and learning <laughs> that was black it. magic. That was it. He was a tax collector. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally picture it. Well, there's a lot of, like, references to, like, what life is like in China and the kind of jobs people have there. Sort of, like, I guess, ancient Chinese government. It, it would... I guess it would uh, go by you if you haven't, like, I, I last semester in school had, like, an Asian history class, so a lot of this stuff seemed sort of familiar to me, like, I could tell he'd done his research into the, like, culture and society, but, um, but yeah, I guess the story goes that, uh, Great Kung Lao, when he's young, he sort of leaves home because he's sort of, he's pondering, like, the nature of God and his religion, and he sort of, he sort of is trying to solve this riddle that was given to him by, like, a mysterious old man in the town square or something like that, and it leads him to climb a, a mountain and meet Raiden. And Raiden and the Order of Light train him for the tournament and all that stuff. That was a, um, that was a very Ten Commandments moment. Well, that's actually kind of a very chosen one, pro, like, Judeo-Christian, like, prophesied savior moment. Yeah. I say Ten Commandments, it's the first thing that comes to mind, but... Basically, he goes through the whole Moses shtick. You must not climb the holy mountain or the gods will get angry. Well, how do you know that? Has anyone else climbed the mountain? No, we don't dare to. Well, I dare to because I want to see what's up there. So he actually goes up in the middle of this pouring rainstorm. And yeah, he first meets Raiden up there and that's what makes him worthy. Because yeah. he bothered. He tried. And, um, well, here's what I found interesting. Like, the, the story is... While he's training with the Order of Light and Raiden, Raiden gives him the amulet, which is, like, it's supposedly made of a piece of the sun and the moon. It's like a, it's like a yin-yang, half is, like, white moon rock, and the other half is, like, yellow molten sun matter. And it makes him, allegedly, it makes him, um, super strong and is the reason that he won the tournament again and again and again against Shang. And then... And then, like, I guess Kung Lao has this premonition that, like, this year I'm not going to win the tournament. I don't want Shang to get my get his hands on this amulet, so I'm going to hide it in the mountain. And that's sort of... It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, or, like, that's the cr contributing factor to why he can't beat Goro. But then... I mean, the, I'm skipping ahead. This is spoilers for the end of the story. It, Raiden eventually uh, tells that the amulet doesn't actually have any power. It was the power inside you all along, like it was a placebo. It was precisely. That was it. <laughs> ah, poor Kung Lao. Yeah. Defeated by his own premonition at heart. <laughs> well, and the giant forum dragon thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, but then the story cuts to the present after great Kung Lao dies. And it's basically, here's um, Kano and his little band of mercenaries who've been hired on this job, and they're, they're climbing this mountain to the Order of Light's village because Shang has hired them to find the amulet. Which, by the way, Kung Lao punched a hole in the sheer rock and stuffed it in and yeah. sealed the rocks <laughs> back up. It was a pretty awesome moment. It's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
So, so they eventually get to the village, and they, um, there's a little scene where they meet modern Kung Lao, and they at first, like, he's, like, welcoming, welcoming them as vi villagers on the road, and then they figure out where they are, and that this monk probably knows where the amulet is, so they take him and another villager hostage, and they're uh, like, look, we're gonna shoot everybody if you don't take us to the amulet, and... As it's, as it's telling the story, it actually cuts back and forth between Scorpion's origin. And the version of Scorpion's origin given in the book is... is wait for it. This is good. This is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, for starters, there is no... There's no Shirai Ryu clan. It's not like two warring clans. He's actually a defector from the Lin Kuei, who left the life of the assassin because he wanted to start a family. And he became like a like a collector on a toll road or something. And his name in the book is was it Young Park? Uh, was that? Hang on, I think you may be right. It's it's one of them. It's Park. It's something Park. I think it's I think it's Young, and his son is named Sui. Yep, it's Young. Okay, so which Young? Young Park was drifting in utter blackness, comfortable and dreamy and dead. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> eventually, eventually, Sub-Zero and some other Lin Kuei tracked him down, dragged him out into the street, uh, killed him with a spear, I think it was? Didn't they disembowel him in front of his family? Yeah. That yeah, was he, it. They, like, he talks about slowly cutting his guts open and them spilling out, and then... They they throw the body into the river, and what actually kills him is drowning. A very cruel death. Yeah. And apparently the the demigod, the Chinese spirit who governs that river, was offended that they left the body in there to bleed out and drown and taint his river. So he's the one who allows Scorpion to come back to life. Except... This, this is before Quan Chi. Yeah. Yeah, they're... Quan Chi didn't come around until mythology, so... So, in the book, the means by which Scorpion comes back to life is by possessing his son. <laughs> he, he appears to him as a ghost and basically asks permission to share his body to get revenge. So... That is correct. And I believe that there was a bit of a connotation there about why specifically he uses a spear. It has to do with the fact that that's how they fished. Or something along those lines. That that sounds familiar. But yeah, so so because it's sort of like Scorpion is actually his son, and he's sort of getting advice from his dad's voice in his head and like sharing his ninja skills. He's sort of more of a rookie throughout the story yes. as he like chases down Sub Zero and fights him and joins the good guys. Yeah, that's worth mentioning. Scorpion here is unequivocally a good guy. He's not a neutral. He's not that, like, he's, 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 he's not a pawn of the Netherrealm or anything. He's a good guy, an unjustly murdered good guy out for, you know, yeah. revenge. He, as the story goes on, he straight up joins Raiden and Liu Kang in fighting against the bad guys. And Sub-Zero is hired by Shang Tsung to help get this amulet, so... Well, um... Talk about Sub Zero for a minute here. He's not too different from like the way you'd characterize Bihan, I guess. But again, going back to how much this book has influenced the way I see a lot of the world of MK over the years, I guess. I guess this book is probably the main reason. Well, this in the Malibu comics as to why I've always kind of hoped to have a couple of games with Bihan as Sub Zero, just to see him as this cold, haha, ruthless, utter bastard of a character. You know, the assassin working for money, out for himself, just for a change. If there could have been one thing about MK9 that I would have liked, that that would have been that would have been controversial going forward to change for the sake of changing, it wouldn't have been you know Squap Smoke and Sub Zero's roles in the story. It would have been keep Bihan alive and see where that goes. Sorry, noob fans, but that's because I totally buy into the notion of. A ninja with ice powers as a literal cold, remorseless assassin. 
which is not to say that I dislike Kwai Liang. I love Kwai Liang. He did become my default sub zero as he did for many of us fans going forward. In fact, I'd say if you don't count Kwai Liang as the default sub zero, there's something very wrong with you. <laughs> but yeah, that's just it, you know. I can I can I, understand that. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a game where the idea is history has changed and stuff happens differently, I do feel like maybe it would have been the better choice to leave Bihan alive instead of all the the Cyber Sub Zero stuff. It would have been interesting to see how he reacted to the Cyber stuff, what he would and, have done. And I say that as as a big noob Cybot fan who would have been bummed about not having noob in the game. It would have I mean. On a certain level, like, I'm super glad that Kwai Liang is his Deadly Alliance self in MKX. At the same time, they did back down like cowards from their idea of changing stuff. <laughs> Truth. I'm not gonna, I mean, I mean, I am beyond happy at the way Smoke turned out in MK9. Best incarnation of the character ever as far as I'm concerned. But I would... I don't know. I might I might still give that up if I knew that we'd have a living Bihan going forward and Cyber Smoke instead. I really would. I can't believe it. who the hell am I? How I, I think know that um. Anymore? Well, we'll get into this later. I actually think Triborg is looking to be the best Smoke in terms of gameplay because I always felt like something was missing from MK9 Smoke's arsenal. Some a little bit more aggressive special moves like at least mm -hmm. one that just straight up does damage as opposed we'll to there. like i like the smoke bomb and i wouldn't get rid of it but just just something that that friggin hits because there's a reason everybody spammed the smoke bomb and teleport punch <laughs> anyway we'll yeah. get to that like you said okay. yeah so so there's i mean the book the book spends a little bit of time giving uh characterization to all these uh these um, henchmen in the Black Dragon who are following Kano. They're all sort of these weird 90s caricatures of gangsters. Like, I'm picturing them wearing um, John Lennon sunglasses with ponytails. <laughs> I remember now that they're there, but I've completely forgotten all of their names. Um, what they did. There's a... Pretty sure one of them had a machine gun. Yeah, well, I think most of them had guns. There was, there was, uh, like, a nerdy guy who, who constantly, like, makes references to old movies. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Oh, oh man. Um, and then, then Sonya is with them, and she's, like, pretending to be, like, some sort of, I don't know, like, a, a, is she, was she supposed to be Russian or American? I think it was Russian. Yeah, she was, like... Jeez, what are their names? One guy's named Moriarty. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a little on the nose. <laughs> There's a guy named I, Schneider. <laughs> ah, yes, this paragraph. I've, I've just stumbled across <laughs> this. I did like how Kano was portrayed in this. I don't feel like Kano has ever been portrayed differently, like uh, miraculously. I feel like in almost every continuity of fiction out there, Kano is such an easy character to understand, get the gist of, and write. There's never been that disparity of character the way you see with some of them. Get a load of this one. Because, yeah, th they are following this map to find the amulet, which was apparently drawn by a baby when the baby was first born. Guess who that baby was? Hint, it was Kung Lao. But, uh, yeah. So Kano's reaction to this whole situation is, meant internally, a map drawn by a baby. Please. Maybe it was dictated by a dog who heard about it from a pigeon. <laughs> It's so hard to fuck up Kano. And yeah. yeah, he's he's always like the the slob who talks in like lazy drawling slang. Like this was way before the movie had made him Australian. I was still hearing the Australian voice in my head just because it fits so well. Oh wait, I just remembered. Page ninety eight of this book, like the page after I just read. This page, uh, while we're talking about Kano, had me assuming that Johnny Cage was already dead. Because uh, in this book, here's the paragraph. Like the time he'd been sent to collect some overdue loans from a macho TV star who'd fallen on hard times. The prop department took my money instead of the fake money we're using in the scene, the actor had said as Kano held him by the lapels of his jacket. Just give me till tomorrow, I'll have it. Kano gave him three seconds to fall on more than hard times as he dropped him from the top of Coldwater Canyon onto a roof about 200 feet below. 
So yeah, I almost <laughs> kind of figured that without saying it as much, they had Kano kill off Johnny Cage behind the scenes. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> So, well, nothing different from I like, I like the end of the end. paragraph. The next day, the papers were all full of actor brings down house and star dies, hairpiece survives. That was it, yes. <laughs> I could totally see Johnny rocking a toupee by 60. <laughs> well, so where were we? Yep, yeah, the, um, so they, they basically force Kung Lao to lead them up the mountain to the, the temple where the, they expect to find the amulet. And, um, they leave some of the black dragons back in town to uh, keep their guns trained on the villagers. And uh, Liu Kang, and he's got, like, some other White Lotus guys with him, are sort of in pursuit. And then, of course, uh, Scorpion and Sub-Zero are traveling their own paths to eventually join the melee. And I kept wondering, because I didn't know this book was set before the tournament, I kept wondering, like, when are, when are they going to get to this? Like, everybody's... <laughs> I kept expecting everybody to eventually arrive on the island, and then Shang would be all like, all right, let's have a tournament. <laughs> yeah, that, um, not so much. Yeah, not really. This is more like... Th this telling is more like Street Fighter in that it's not so much of a tournament as it's a bunch of stuff that happened. Yeah. With the yeah, exception like... of, of course, Street Fighter 2, which was an actual tournament. They all sort of, they just eventually all luckily end up in the same place, like, climbing this mountain after each other, and then there's a big fight, and, um, Shang summons Reptile, who, until this point in the book, had not been seen. Like, he just sort of goes to his palace, to Khan, and he's all like, look, I need a little more help. <laughs> and he's like, here, have another I dude. <laughs> I should, um, bring up a brief point. Now, even at the age I was at, I mean, I knew that this was not canon, right? I mean, I, I knew right away that, like, okay, they're, they're telling the Scorpion is wonky, but, I mean, I'll go with it. But something in specifically, the, because of the way that they handled Scorpion, him being so different and whatnot, I thought to myself at the time, so, while I'm reading this, I can expect to see anyone dealt with any number of ways. There's a scene here in which, I forget who does it. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's Shang Tsung. Shang, Shang Tsung does it. In order to facilitate finding the amulet, he fuses Kano and Kung Lao together. Yeah. He, um, he, like, turns them into, like, it's not like a Dragon Ball Z fusion. They become this, like, horrible smoke monster with two faces or something. Yeah. And reading this at the time, I suppose maybe it was. I, I, could, I, I could be right. I mean, I thought to myself, was this the way that they were handling smoke? <laughs> was this Jeff Rovin's plan for smoke? He was Kano and Kung Lao put together? Okay, why not? Sure, you've done crazier. <laughs> I, I don't think so. But the the plot reason that very this happens young. is basically Shang Tsung goes, well, this, this monk knows where the amulet is. He won't tell me. So I'm going to merge him with one of my guys, and then that guy will be able to read his mind and go where he needs to go. Pretty well. And, uh... And Quay Ninja. Anyway. It, uh, it does work. Uh, Kano gets to the, the, uh, rock where the amulet is hidden and busts it free. And then afterwards, he and, uh, Kung Lao are split back into their normal selves. And when Shang gets the medallion, he goes back to his palace and starts, uh, basically summoning an army of demons and zombies. And, Pretty well. And he's on his island, and everybody has to sort of figure out how to get there quickly. Scorpion and Raiden can teleport, but uh, Liu Kang and Kung Lao are stuck behind until uh, Kung Lao actually reveals that what Shang had just done to him, he learned how to replicate that spell, and he and Liu Kang become a hybrid smoke monster thing to fly to the <laughs> island. <laughs> Uh, I'd forgotten that second part. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so they get to Shang's Island, and I'm, I'm, Sonya has been kidnapped, and Barack is trying to sacrifice her to a carrier pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> this carrier pigeon is just for the record. This carrier pigeon totally does its job. It's worthy of the sacrifice. It is. It is a regular ass pigeon. All it did was deliver the job to the contract to Sub Zero. Like, hey, I want your, I want to hire you for this mission, and Shang is all like, deliver the message and I'll make a human sacrifice to you. And then he... Yes. Shang attempts to sacrifice Sonya to a pigeon. 
But that pigeon did a good job, goddammit. It it did deliver the message. It was successful, but it's a fucking pigeon. It's not like a demon pigeon from Outworld. It's just a regular-ass pigeon. <laughs> I guess Chang loves something. Well, he's a tradition. You know, he's from ancient China. <laughs> you sacrifice <laughs> things to stuff. That's black magic. <laughs> what was the pigeon's name? Uh, I gotta go back and... No, the pigeon keep going. Had a name? I'll find the pigeon's name. The pigeon may have had a name. The pigeon had a name. Keep on going. You'll All right. So, so the... I mean... Hamachi. The, the pigeon's oh, yeah. name is Hamachi. Okay. <laughs> It's a good, strong name. So, you sort of... Like, the chapter where Baraka is going to sacrifice her sort of ends on a cliffhanger, and for several chapters you think they may have actually killed off Sonya, and then it cuts back and shows how she actually escaped. Like, she she actually grabbed the pigeon cage with her legs or something like that and held it in front of the blade, so Baraka killed the pigeon instead accidentally, and then she knocked them all out. Poor Hamachi. And so... And, um, Kung Lao gets to sort of the, uh, like, the portal room where, um, Shang is trying to use the medallion to bring Shao Kahn to Earthrealm. And he finds that Sonya has disrupted the summoning circle, and Ruthe, the little imp guy, is dying. And Kung Lao has compassion. So, so Shang is all like, please, you have to fix the circle and finish this spell, or else Ruthe will die. And... And Kung Lao sort of makes like he's going to go along with it. And then when he finishes the spell, all the demons start getting sucked back into the portal. And Shang is all like, what did you do? And he's all like, well, I, I did what you told me to do, but I didn't repair the circle. So the... Also, I said the spell backwards. <laughs> because Shang was trying so... to trick him, the spell would have completed... Instead, it's sucking all the Outworlders back to their home realm. Which will save Ruthe's life, so he's not like he lied. But he tricked Shang. He's a monk, he wouldn't lie. <laughs> oh, brief point here. There is an interesting mention of the history of the Lin Kuei, which specifically refers to them abducting babies and raising them on their own grounds. Yeah, I always so found that pretty interesting. Apparently that's... I mean, yeah. Apparently that's true in every canon ever, so there you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is, uh, yeah, this is predating uh, MK9 by a number of years. So, I mean, there are just so many things I wonder. Did they go back and take a little bit of inspiration from this? You never know. Well, I think, I think in canon, the first reference to them um, taking children is... I don't know that it straightforwardly says they abduct kids in mythologies, but it does make... Reference to them basically, like, taking people who show a uh, potential for superpowers and training them and indoctrinating them to be ninja. The first uh, the first thing I remember that literally said we steal babies from their families was an episode of Conquest, which was a little bit after huh. Mythologies. Like, I think the same year or a year after. And then mm. MK9 just sort of followed from all those other references because ten years later it just become accepted as canon. Fair enough. So, a number of non-official confirmations before the real deal, then. Yeah. Maybe. Still. Nice. Yep. So, so everybody, all the all the demons and monsters, get sucked back into Outworld, except Goro and Reptile, because Goro is so big that he's able to, like, wedge himself in a doorway until the portal is closed. Didn't, like, Reptile, like, smack against him? Yeah, yeah, and, he like, was, like... stuck there for a bit? Yeah. Yeah, he was, like flat up against him and they're both trying to avoid being vacuumed into the portal and then um and then basically the story ends with them going all right well you didn't get your medallion shang we're gonna take off and he's like i'll see you at the tournament <laughs> more or less <laughs> so it's all like to be continued in mortal kombat one pretty then, well yeah and then it well here's here's my favorite part of the book and when i know I say that, that yeah i say I, it sarcastically i know that you've been no no you can't be sarcastic. You know you loved this moment. I know exactly <laughs> what you're about to say. You, you, you foreshadowed it on Link. Foreshadowed it on Link. And I know that you've blazed through this book just to get to this point. Do you want to read it or do I? I will read it. The, okay. The last chapter is a okay, short wait, scene in Outworld with Shao Kahn, where he's basically <laughs> talking about how Shang failed, but he still has the tournament. And if he fails again, they'll have... Uh, I'll just read. Uh, Tell Shang Tsung that if he fails me again, if he fails to obtain a soul for me in the next Mortal Kombat, I will find a way to enter the contest and take the soul I need. Perhaps his little regent, or if you tarry another moment, perhaps what is left of yours. A most reasonable and sane course of action, your godliness. Though I must confess, mighty ruler of the outworld, 
I would look forward to such a contest. And then Shang says, sh- er, Shao Kahn says, Rufe, I would look forward to such a Mortal Kombat too. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, uh, even, it even ends on a I- pun. Even as young as I was, that made me wince. I died a little inside when I read that. <laughs> I closed my eyes and shook my head and held my temples. Oh, oh such man. a poor combat, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's only gotten funnier with age. <laughs> uh. So that's, that's Jeff Rovin's MK novel, available at wherever fine books are sold. Honestly... You should probably be able to find a copy of one of these pretty damn easily. I'm I'm Back. sure like I'm sure Amazon has a million for like five bucks or less, probably even if you get a used copy. It's worth a perusal, I would say, even if you're hardcore indoctrinated to MK. It's worth the, the, having this funny little look into a continuity that never was, even when the old continuity was the big fish in the sea. It's a nice little footnote to this to the series. Very fun. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed perhaps, it. Perhaps a bit dated, but a good read, I'd say. Worth a worth a week. Something 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 good for a long trip, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. It's um I I kind of liked what I liked about it kind of is sort of the uh the references to like Chinese mythology and stuff. In that way it sort of felt like Big Trouble in Little China again to me. Like, you know, uh, a passion product, like a work of art from somebody who knew or was really interested in the, the culture and mythology of China. That is one of the big things that com- that uh, I came away from this book with. I really appreciated how they kind of tried to fill in the blanks in terms of deities and the spiritual, mystical world of Mortal Kombat. For a while, I looked at this as as close as I could possibly ever get to having backstory for the first tournament. Because I think this thing might have come along a little bit before the first movie did. Yeah, that sounds right. What year was... I mean, it was, it was 90... I mean, 95 was the move, when the movie came out, but I feel like I, I had seen the book before the movie. I mean, in bookstores. Like, I'd never... I was aware that the book existed. Like, I'd never actually had a chance to read it until just now. But I feel like I had seen copies on the shelf before I'd seen the movie as a kid. Like, at the very least, I was aware that the book was not a novelization of the movie, because I okay. I also had a separate Mortal Kombat book that was a novelization of the movie. This baby was printed June 1995. I'm guessing there was only one printing. Yes, the, the, the front cover says, first time in print, so that's an absolute. And the movie came just two months later, August 18th. So All right. Just by a little bit. Okay. Uh, is there, uh, that's that. Is there anything you want to touch on about it before we talk about video games? <laughs> I think we've covered uh, the main meat and bones of the story. Uh, da, 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 da. The, the things that I really wanted to go over was just the utter fucked up attitude of Kung Lao and Kano being merged together. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely... An odd idea that, like, everybody but Johnny met before the tournament. And, like, the, the White Lotus is, like, these crime fighters who hang out with the special forces or something. No, I guess that that's pretty well it. I would uh, suggest leaving any further subtle nuances and details to be discovered by our listeners if they choose to seek this book out. That makes sense. Which I again recommend. So, Game Talk. Yeah, so Mortal Kombat XL, Combat Pack Two. We're uh, we're getting the pit for free, which is pretty much what I expected. A very nice touch. It's uh, despite how it's the pit two, which is also what I expected since that was the one in MK9. But with spikes. Just like in MK9. That's always going to nag at me for some for some reason. I'm I'm very very stringent about that. The pit one had spikes. The pit two didn't. I just I miss the pit one. If I, I miss the pit three, honestly. Yeah, if I'm being honest, I would really really be excited to see a reimagining of the pit three. 
But, I don't know, I mean, I can understand why they went with two, and it does look good, and I'm, I'm excited that it has Blaze and Hornbuckle in the back bridge again. From what I was actually seeing, um, they appear to be using a variety of random special move animations from multiple characters. Yeah, I've well, seen, what I've I kept what seeing like over and over again in footage teleport. is that a teleport. Um, Hornbuckle kept using uh, Sub-Zero's freeze. Yeah, there's that. And I think he does Smoke's uh, shake maneuver, too. Huh. Like, as, 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 a, as a teleport. I'm sure I've seen that at least once. That little uh, fingers into other fingers standing still thing, just for a moment. Yeah. The, uh, the Naruto jutsu hand signs. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... I, I actually, I do like the the stage fatality animation where you, like, bounce off one of the pillar spikes and spin to the bottom. I'm not gonna, I mean... A, that was a neat touch. I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth or anything. I'm grateful we're getting it for free. And I'm not gonna complain any further that the Pit, that the pit 2 has spikes. I understand why they did it. It is more visually upsetting, I suppose. At this point, I'm just... I'll take anything from, like, the first three games as a bonus <laughs> stage, because I just... There's something about Razor. watching in MKX, <laughs> Sector and Cyrax fighting on the pit. <laughs> that it's like... I don't know, it's like coming home. <laughs> That's fair. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this right now. If you at any point become excited for the prospect of the bank returning as a stage, I'm going to come to America to give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> that's all it wasn't all wine and roses some of those stages from back in the day did suck just that's, a bit that's fair that's fair i'm not i'm not a big fan of the bank <laughs> why did they even bother well you know they're the bank i think was unfinished because it, there was that concept I've... art uh where it was supposed to have like a crashed helicopter sticking out of the windows I think if I it had looked more would... apocalyptic, it would have been a decent stage. All it needed was a bunch of corpses everywhere. Maybe, I mean, MK3 was a bit toned down, was very toned down in that respect uh, in terms of how much unpleasantness could be on screen in a certain context. MK3 was very cartoony in nature when uh, it came to the violence. Yeah. So that was probably the I, I always found it odd that it was called the bank. It doesn't look like a bank. It's just a hallway inside of a skyscraper. I kind of figure that like the telling that uh, the teller booths were from the viewer's perspective, hmm. I guess. I don't I don't know many banks where you have to like take the elevator several stories up to get to the tellers. Got some swanky ass banks out there, man. The likes of which you and I <laughs> never see in our pay grades. Yeah, all right. So <clears throat> I don't know so what I would call that building. Uh, I guess. So there's the pit. Yep, and... there's the pit, and there's. We have had significant gameplay footage of Triborg. And I, the first thing I want to say is, when Triborg was first revealed, I was extremely down on him, because it was intimated on Twitter by one of the devs that Triborg is his own separate character, that he's a new guy who imitates Sector Cyrax and Smoke. But... Now we're seeing intros and fatalities and wind poses all consist of three robots standing next to each other. And I'm wondering, especially because, like, the variation names aren't, like, clever references to Sector Cyrix and Smoke. They literally say the names Sector, Unit, LK-99, Cyrax, LK-4D4, Smoke, LK-7-T2. Which is actually, I think, worth noting just briefly. This is the first time, I think, in any game where they've brought up Smoke's serial number. Is it? I thought his yeah. serial number was in his MK3 bio. It might have been, but I don't know if that his MK3 bio was in any of the ports. I, I really don't think it was. Oh. Hmm. I feel, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, like, Smoke's MK3 bio is something that kind of slipped through the cracks in terms of it being present in the game, because he was a secret character in MK3. And by the time Ultimate rolled around, I remember, I remember like sitting down and like watching the attract mode and seeing everyone's bio come up. Cyber Smoke's bio didn't show up in Trilogy at the very least. You might now, be right. Seeing, now MK, like, I, like 
this is the thing. I've seen that bio in strategy guides. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen any game reference a serial number. This is such a tiny and minute point, and it's such a small thing. Yeah. But I'm looking. I congratulate on, them for remembering that. It's. Nice. I'm looking at MK Warehouse right now, and everybody's bio has a screenshot except Smokes, which is just text. So yep. I guess it wasn't in the game. So I have to. I have to give them kudos to them. This is such a small thing, but. I'm glad and sad to say thank you for not fucking this up. Thank you for remembering Smoke's serial number, Netherrealm. We <laughs> Well, I think I think they'd be in a lot of trouble with us if they hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's but, um, cool to see that finally set in stone. But yeah, so I just wanna like the thing that worried me most about Triborg was the idea that he's not really Sector and Cyrax, and it's looking like at the very least, like, we don't know who he is yet, but we do know that there's more than one body. Like, that he's at least three robots. And that's what I want. I want him to be the real Sector Cyrax and Cyber Smoke. And I mean, granted, different timeline, Smoke was never a robot, but if he's if he's from an alternate universe like all the mirror matches are, I'm that's what I want. <laughs> Anything... I can... Anything to have Cyber Smoke back. And I I'm, can buy it, just give me a good explanation. Yeah. That's all I want. A good explanation. Not Smoke is now suddenly a robot. I'm afraid of this. Well, I mean he's still What I think I mean he's still an Anenra down in the Nether Realm. The only thing that I could think of they would say other than that he's a crossover from another dimension is that like someone picked Smoke's corpse up out of the church at the end of MK9 and made it a robot anyway. I can see that, and I'd be okay with it. Yeah, I, I I don't have a problem with whatever excuse they come up with, as long as it's a pre-existing character and not fucking Chameleon or a new Chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want... I'm right with you on this. I would like this to be some version of these three original characters, timeline switch or otherwise... A very cynical part of me is worried that this is just going to be a bunch of pre-programmed Tekunin or Lin Kuei generics. Well, I feel like if they come back, they have to make a bigger entrance than as multiple parts of one DLC character. The, the worst case scenario is new guy or generic foot soldier. The next best thing, which I would accept is that all three are Sector. This is like a new body he made for himself. And he was remote controlling it in that little cutscene that picks up the head in the first reveal trailer. I would be pleasantly delighted with that possibility. I am open to explanation. But Just make it a good one. I mean, given given the three bodies thing, and the that there are tag team finishing moves and shit like that, I, I'm hoping... It's the real Sector Cyrax and Smoke, and if it is, I will be very, very happy. If it's not, all... I can at least pretend, and I'll still be really, really happy. What I'm saying is, <laughs> at this point, I'm very pleased with how Triborg looks. Especially That's considering, fair, so am I. Especially considering that his Smoke skin is no longer default generic gray with blue eyes... He's actually sort of purplish with red eyes now, like he, he's supposed to be. He does look good. I will not sit there and deny this. I'm probably going to spend the money on him. Yeah. 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 They, I, they, the way it's looking right now, I am, I'm not getting Combat Pack 2 for... Okay, the main reason I'm not going to get Combat Pack 2 is because I don't want the Brazil pack on my console. Because then when I'm playing arcade mode, I'll have to look at those fucking ugly yellow and green costumes at random. No, I, just, I'm, I will do anything I'm, to not have the Brazil pack. <laughs> I'm still not getting Combat Pack 2 at all. Because I'm full of righteous indignation. I also like don't want Leatherface. I will not pay money for anything with Leatherface in it. That's, that, that's just it. I mean... It's a point which I don't want to belabor any further, but I really do feel like they crossed a pretty big line with the amount of guest characters going on in this game. 
to the point that, I mean, people on Twitter are just still shitting on them for it. They bugged a lot more people than a couple of casual fans. I think there would be... spiteful, but I'm glad to see it. I think people would show forgiveness if there was any sign that there was going to be a more DLC characters after Combat Pack 2, but it's definitely looking like this is the end of the cycle, because they're putting out the complete edition. If we get MKXXL, Bo Wright Show needs to be lying in a puddle of his own puke on the cover. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> But um, I think I think considering how upset people who've already bought the game are at how cheap the XL version is, I don't see them going for being happy if if they go the Street Fighter route and put out a third copy of no. the same game. Which no, I mean, I would I would be okay with it because anything with more content. I, I am points. a whore for more content. <laughs> I mean. If I'm to ever actually pick up, like I've said in the past, if I'm, if I'm to actually pick up a solid disc version of this title, XL, it is going to be from a pawn shop for 10 bucks. They are not getting any more of my money than absolutely necessary. And that's probably only if I feel really inclined to do it. If I really want to spend the extra money, which I don't... Well, well here's, I don't know. I like collecting things. I, I have yeah. MK games on systems that I don't even own. Yeah. That's probably it. Yeah, here, here's the but, thing for me. If you already own the game, the XL version's not for you. It isn't. It's all the same content that you can already get. There's nothing new in the XL version. It's just a cheaper bundle for people who haven't bought any of the bundles. That's who it's being targeted. Not and, like, if you do game. own the game, the only reason I can see to care about XL is if you want all the DLC to be on a disc, so that ten years from now, if you want to go back and play the game, you don't have to worry about the Xbox Live servers being down for the one, because we're on the new generation or whatever. Or if you just collect MK games on various systems, and you have them all lined up against your wall, yeah, on six uh, separate rows, I mean, I to be dusted off. I can see a world, here's the thing, I can see a world where, like, because I already own MKX for the Xbox, eventually I'm going to get a PS4. I'll probably have to get XL for that. If I want to, you know, play with you or anything like that. This is assuming I don't actually wind up with an Xbox One one of these days, which I said I was going to do for Killer Instinct. <laughs> well, I have, to, I have to get a PlayStation anyway if I want to play Street Fighter V. Yes. Come and be a family man with us. <laughs> uh, but actually, I want to go back to smoke for a second before I forget, because I'm rather tired at the moment. Even as big as an MK9 smoke fan as I am, I can't help but fall in love with how they've done the smoke incarnation of the fighting style in this game. It looks good. It looks menacing. The colors are right. The fact that there's multiple little tridents instead of one makes you feel fresh enough to not just feel like a straight-up scorpion clone maneuver. It's nice. I appreciate the work that's been done with this. He's got the old smoky teleport back. I appreciate the fact that while they didn't give him the MK9 smoke back forward teleport punch, it's still part of his chain combo. So they didn't forget. Well, they... It feels... The it feels last like hit of the EX version is still the special... And the, the two punches are a chain. That's so I'm I mean, thinking yeah. if you do the teleport at the end of the chain, you can basically replicate the MK9 teleport punch. Pretty well. So he basically just, he has it, all the moves he had in 9, plus the harpoon. Yep. Which, I mean, that's, to... that's what I wanted. I always felt like he was missing an offensive move, like I said. So now I feel like he's a complete package, and I'm really excited to play as Cyber Smoke. I can take it or leave it. In term, I mean, another offensive move, that is. Also, I guess, yeah, the spear. I mean, tridents. Because I've always envisioned Smoke as kind of a hit-and-run character, character to the point where when he first came out, when MK9 was first out and I played him, and I'm like, they had to have been reading my posts on MKO. This is exactly <laughs> what I always wanted from a fucking character. I've said a million times, hit and run, and that's exactly what Smoke was. Also worth mentioning the fact that they gave him different variations on uh, the Smoke Ball, where he can actually toss it wherever he wants now. Yeah, Which yeah. is very nice. Well, I, I wonder how useful that is. I guess I guess if you want to like fake outs, yeah, fake, fake outs. outs. 
So because I mean can, the thing tracks you. Yeah, the 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 neutral tracks. So if you want to be tricky, you can throw it forward and back and mess with somebody's head. But if you actually want to hit them, the neutral is always going to hit. The, the thing that I really like is that his air throw has more personality no, now because he turns into a smoke cloud and spins you around as opposed to, like, a generic toss so, in the air. I'm going to get the one nasty point out of the way. That fatality was balls, yo. <laughs> you didn't like it? No, I just know. I, I liked it. I felt like it was sort of a... Well, here's the thing. Like, the, the maybe, model for the compactor looks looked... really cartoony. Maybe if it didn't, maybe if it actually looked more like some sort of actual death machine and not a funhouse attraction. Yeah, the I can see that. The I like the idea of it. The the reference yeah. to Sector's MK3 chess compactor and the the meat cube it spits out at the end. But the the compactor model itself looks like a fucking bouncy house. <laughs> it does. If it was just a bit more industrial looking, I'd be okay with it. It's because it's too I, colorful. I think. Like, they, they painted it in red and yellow, like, Sector and Cyrax colors. I don't know that that was necessary. Nudge, nudge, elbow to the ribs. <laughs> and I can't, uh, that's it, I, I can't say I dislike the concept, because Sector's compactor is, for some stupid reason, one of my favorite fatalities. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's always been. Anyhow. Well, they... All of the games have always had some ridiculous, way too large to fit in their thing come out of the robot's chests. And it's always been great, as silly as it is. <laughs> like, I still, is I still love Cyrax's Deadly Alliance fatality, where he fits your body inside his chest. <laughs> Grinding you as you go in, yes. Alright, so that's uh, Triborg. Well, we should also it's... mention... I. He's more of a quad Borg. <laughs> oh, yes. There's a, How his do you no feel about variation, this? variation. Because he doesn't share any special moves, would have had no moves if they hadn't done this. So they made his no variation, variation, Cyber Sub Zero. Sub Zero. Clap, clap, clap. Which. Cool well, for the fans. Cool yeah, the I fans. mean, it's. I appreciate the effort, because that is extra effort to go to. <clears throat> I I still don't like Cyber Sub Zero. He's still no. a a it's symbol a that represents everything dumb it's that happened in MK9. It's unclean, precious. It's I also think unclean. his move set is uninspired because he still got a Cyrax bomb. But I was always willing to defend that because Smoke was halfway sector back. Yeah, in MK9. yeah. I mean, that's that's a thing, but. That was lazy when they made smoke, so it's lazy now. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I just tend to be a bit more forgiving when I see parallels to the old school days. Yeah, yeah. I just, the, he does have a new move. He has this, like, drone thing that enhances his moves or something. From what I've been able to see, yeah. It's it's more like they just took the model for Cyrax's bomb and made it float around Cybersub's head. Well, again, not the hugest fan of the character. Yeah. Again, has I he, appreciate has he the, the dive kick. Does he have the dive kick? I, I saw the it? dive kick in his moves list. What I'm really the dive in, kick is there. Excellent. What I would happy. be happy to see is if he still has that that like giant Final Fantasy VII sword in his combos. I feel like that's kind of necessary. That I hope I hope it's in there. We haven't cool. seen it. Don't know if he has it. I'm hoping he does because that would actually be something cool. I kind of like that sword. But um. We also, I mean, the the. This is the first show you and I have done since the second gameplay trailer. So I mean, we yeah. we saw a little bit of Bo Ride show. We saw these new costumes, Cassie and Jackie dressed as Scorpion and Sub Zero. Um, Who oh boy? There's a there's a a skin from the comic for Kotalkan, like what he looked like in his origin story. A nice touch. Yeah, I like that. It's sort of a cool thing to do. Um, it's like, hey, the, the main game acknowledged side media, straight up forward. Nice. Well done. Yeah, yeah. So, um, a lot Mad of people Max are pissed esque, off of... Hmm? Mad Mask-esque skins for uh, Devora and Takeda and um, Aaron. I like the Aaron one. 
The other one's very definitely an ICS. Mm-hmm. Can't be angry at uh, many of the costumes going on here. I like Ferrator's new one, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, Alien looked good, if you're into Alien. I'm still on the fence about whether or not I give a shit. <laughs> no comment. I guess, well, I mean, the thing is, like, I'm mad at Leatherface, because Leatherface is a Z-lister. But I like, I I was always a proponent of the idea that if you're going to have a guest character, have a second one from the same universe for that guy to fight. So that he doesn't feel so jarring fighting MK characters, he can fight his own dude. So I like that Predator got Alien. I just, I wish that Jason had gotten somebody who doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they already brought back Cyber Sub Zero. They brought back Freddy again and asked us to pay money for him again. I don't know. He better goddamn well have. All, all I'm saying is, had. like, if Ed if Ed really wants to stick to his guns about not making you pay for the same thing twice, you got to acknowledge that people still want the characters. Fucking <laughs> give them out for free. <laughs> you you oh, you suck so this, many fucking money out of us. This so much money, game. you can afford to, to give us two characters for free. Give us fucking Rain and Freddy, and shut up, and we will too. Fujin. <clears throat> anyway. Well, Fujin would be nice, but I would want to pay money for Fujin because... Yes, he's that worth would actually it. be a welcome product, something we asked for. But hey, yeah. all right, I'm coming off as cynical again. Now, going back to that, I can't completely dismiss Leatherface as a Z-lister because the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a fucking classic horror movie. It's about that he's kind of irrelevant now. Yeah. I... That's... And supposedly there's a new movie coming out which just makes him feel like a bit of an advanced commercial. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, we keep going back. Like, even the reason they picked Bo Raicho as the Mortal Kombat character is because he's going to be in that web series, not because people asked for him. And I say that as a guy who likes Bo Raicho. Mm-hmm. Same. Oh, yeah, that web series. Should we, uh... I don't know. Well, Do we don't have really... much to talk about there? Yeah, we don't know anything yet. Other than that it's coming. <laughs> the costume looks kind of suspect. Eh, kind of dollar the, store quality going on. I don't know. A, another web series from the same guys who made the last one. I don't have high hopes. Like, the only reason I I think there will be to give this time of day is because of that way back a year or two ago when we had that cast list. I am intrigued Mm -hmm. by the character Ron Tan Cho. I think if he is indeed (laughs) a relative of Bo Rai Cho, I am interested to see more backstory for Bo Rai Cho that sort of, you know, fleshes him out. Did we figure out who Salazar was? Was Salazar turned out to be Aaron Black, and I... I was very reactionary about the this Salazar guy because he sounded like another Movado. Aaron is a cool character, so that's well, my I'm not bad. Gonna shit on, <laughs> I'm not going to shit on forthcoming Legacy season three or whatever the hell it is they're calling it now because as many things as the first two series have done wrong, I feel like they've done just as much right. I think they're I calling can't, it MKX yeah. Beginnings or something like that. I could be wrong. Something like that. It's basically even more of a tie-in than it used to Here's, <sighs> here's the thing for me. If this is indeed an MKX tie-in, bring back Lyndon Ashby. <laughs> Why not, you know? The guy has an age today. And if you're going to have an older Johnny Cage, get older Johnny Cage. You can make him up to look older, even though he doesn't. Yes, you got Carrie Tagawa, why not? <sighs> at least One at least only. Lyndon Ashby looks like Johnny Cage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Carrie. Why don't you grow a beard? Why? I don't think grow his hair back. I don't like bald shang, it's weird. You just put a wig on him. Why is that so hard? <laughs> it's all right. Any uh, hmm? I don't know. Any the guy, else? the guy from Legacy Season One had long hair and a goatee, and, and we gave him up for Jackson. Carrie. Why is that an upgrade? <sighs> because it's Carrie. Yeah, Carrie is Shang. He we all acts know the Carrie role is well. Shang. I he's he's iconic. He's, 
he's kind of made that character his own to a point where almost, almost Trevor, Trevor Goddard Kano uh, level here. Well, here's the thing. Nearly. It's like, it's like, you know, when people go back and they watch uh, Batman 1989 and they say Jack Nicholson was just playing Jack Nicholson. Which or I find like, you know, cer- certain actors, they're sort of always their self, no matter what role they're in. That's, that's Carrie. Like, he's... You watch any uh, movie where Carrie Tagawa's in it, other than um, Johnny Tsunami, <laughs> and he's playing Shang Tsung again. So basically, we're telling me is that we base that we just kind of need to follow Carrie around for a day and see how Shang Tsung lives his life. More or less. <laughs> what does he do when he's not feeding joints. on souls? <laughs> I know this excellent bacon joint around the corner. It will make your mouth water with sumptuous delight. <laughs> Treasure these egg rolls. <laughs> As if they were your last. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to have dinner with the man now. I really do. Any other uh, major news? Uh, I think that about covers it. All righty. I mean, unless you want to talk about uh, Street Fighter story mode. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think that's kind of more Warrior Shrine material. Or um, I, Do you have anything to say about it? Because I'm excited. I just, um, I just, I find it interesting that it revolves around the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't really know what's going on, but I think it's, it's fair to assume M. Bison has some sort of uh, gigantic fuck-off anime uber weapon of death. Um, from what I've been reading in the Street Fighter Unlimited comic books, the new stage people have been seeing with the giant hands together is, again, some form of energy siphon thing. Much well, that's, that, that's that. what Bison's always doing. Yeah. He wants, he wants to steal was, the, uh, I don't know, the Dark Hedo from Ryu or something. Yes. But the thing about the Udon comic, what it's showing now, is the fact that it's Gil and the Illuminati who made that machine. So yeah, they're they're trying to bridge the gap see. between five and three, which I'm I'm happy with because I I am Finally. ready for the end of Bison. I think we all are. I just I'm ready for them to finally acknowledge three is a part of the story. Now, can we move past it? Is the question. Yeah, yeah. Something the, said the after future. three with because I, th- I think the mo I think the the sentiment I have seen the most across the board on the internet is people like the alt costumes more than the primaries for guys like Ryu and you know the ones that look older or different. Yep, you're not wrong. I've always wanted the Street Fighter characters to kind of age a little bit, and MKX blew my mind, and it still does blow my mind that it allowed its characters, or some of the characters that weren't lies and dead, to jump forward by a couple of decades in appearance. I've always had this image in my mind of Ryu being kind of the way you've always pictured Shang Long, such as a non-entity as that character is, the guy that, like, just tosses out fireballs one hand. Well, go Ken, really. But yeah. ha- having one arm wrapped behind him because he's been taught by Oro, fighting one-handed. And they're just getting there. They're getting there. Bison's got gray hairs now. So we're seeing a bit of progress on that front, but they're too afraid to change anyone iconic. Although, it has been said that, if I'm remembering right, Ryu's alt costume does have its story mode properties. This is a way he's going to look in the game at some point. That's Probably that's just cool. during his travels. Yeah, I, I mean, that's sort of... That's the thing I'd like to see, that, you know, they're in the story. And, I mean, the thing is, from what I've heard, the story will be fairly short. I mean, compared to, like, the ones we're getting in the Mortal Kombat games, those are, like, three hours of cutscenes. I think they said that this one is about an hour worth of cutscenes or something like that. That's but, more than we've really gotten from Street Fighter ever. Yeah, so. I mean, for Street Fighter, that's a lot. So, I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to it. For me, it's just, it's nice to see Street Fighter caring about its story for the first time in a very long time. Like, time was, they would tell 
passable stories without really trying very hard at it. And for that, for my money, Alpha 2 is the standout. Alpha 2 is where it really does begin. I've always liked the casual nature, well, not casual, but the, f- the easygoing nature of that game, how it just lets its characters evolve and Bison isn't everyone's last boss. This is how all these people meet and their last bosses are who is important to them going forward. Yeah, I've always it I've always liked path. the approach of the the last boss being a variable depending on your character, whoever fits their story. Like any any t- any game that takes that approach, I like that. I don't I don't know that like I I would I like, like to see that in Mortal Street Kombat. Fighter. I don't think we always need the giant warlord, you know, like Shao Kahn or corrupted Shinnok to be the end of every mode or whatever. I'm more used to it in terms of MK. It's kind of a thing that's always stuck there. But it would yeah. be an interesting change of pace to have it be the opposite. Yes. And I know, and I know why, why Ed likes to stick with the big, strong end boss, because Shinnok wasn't that successful as a boss in MK4 when he was just a regular member of the mm-hmm. roster. But, I mean, if you put a story behind it, and it's a decent character, because, I mean, the thing is, Shinnok didn't really have moves of his own in MK4. He was a shitty character in that game. I don't know. It's just it's an experiment I'd like to see them try. Wouldn't be opposed. I guess that about covers uh, Street Fighter V and its story mode. Very much looking forward to it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Don't ex- I don't have high expectations of it, but it's nice that they're nice that they're trying. Yeah, and so I, I, I wouldn't hack. say that they they weren't trying because I think I mean with four there was a lot of supplementary material, little little anime videos. Uh, and... They were trying, but not very hard. Yeah, the... a lot of that a lot of that um, that supplement supplementary material can't even be taken as any form of canon. It just does not match. Yeah, I mean, well, you never really. No, for sure with Street Fighter because there's so many because like the the thing with Alpha was they they wanted to make a game that imitated that original anime movie even though the anime movie wasn't canon I mean they made elements of it canon through Alpha still not the part that matters though which is Bison driving a truck <laughs> God I can't tell you how many years I've wanted to see a similar adaptation of Street Fighter Three handled by the exact same team hmm. if only yeah. Well, we'll always have Udon. We will. And their comics are quite tasty. Mm, yes. Uh, so I guess that uh, pretty much covers everything we wanted to talk about this week. Indeed, I suppose it does. What are we uh, looking at next, do you think, for our, for our dear listeners? What other supplementary material? Do we start the dreaded path down the Malibu Road? <laughs> do we force ourselves to go through all of Conquest? Uh... Do we... In desperation, start reviewing G.I. Joe figures. <laughs> well, I don't want to. I don't want to run out of material too soon. <laughs> and uh, honestly, Conquest is not that hard of a slog for me. I very much enjoyed that uh, series' commitment to having unnecessary, gratuitous sex in every episode. I'm afraid, man. I bought that DVD a good half of a year ago. I still haven't. I still have not put it in the player. I'm afraid of what time is going to do to my rep- is going to do to my perception of this show. <sighs> uh, I'm not going to say it still it's holds so up years. because it wasn't like it was good the first time. But <laughs> I I'm think just, I think in reveling mind, in the I'm, cheesiness is has gotten no less easy. <laughs> I'm remembering a slightly shittier basic version of Xena Warrior Princess or Hercules: The Legendary that's, Journeys. That's about right. Okay. That's about right. <laughs> it won't be too bad for me then. Maybe one day we can do uh, MK and the journey continues and Marvel as Luke Kang jumps over a fucking box for the 89th time. <laughs> oh, man. We've got to do that. We have to, oh, like, actually... A... That should be our next commentary. Because we... we can oh, get through this. Journey begins. That that one actually does hurt me. <laughs> but we can do that. <laughs> that thing always disappointed me. Always. All right. I guess that's it for the night, then? Yep, that's it. Uh, Have a good night, listeners, or day, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, Thanks for tuning in. Thank you very kindly for listening to us and our despondency and our optimism. It's appreciated. (laughs) Have a good night. Peace out.
I would look forward to such a Mortal Kombat 2. <laughs> dun, dun, dun.